thank you so much for the invitation to come speak uh, uh, as part of the OTS webinar series. Um, and I'm going to be uh, presenting uh, on Pathways for Patient-Centered Interventional Genomic Medicine. Um, I hope through this, uh, this seminar to give an update as to the really exciting developments that we're seeing from all parts of the field around uh, finding ways to use oligonucleotides to address uh, these uh, very serious uh, and orphan rare diseases that uh, have remained under the radar uh, for too long. Uh, my disclosures are on this following slide here uh, with consulting arrangements with Biomarin, Servier, and IXLs, um, as well as a number of volunteer efforts um, in support of a variety of nonprofits, including our very own OTS, where I'm really honored to serve as a board member. The topic of my seminar is, uh, as folks who know me uh, well uh, understand, is to focus attention on this increasingly visible category of unmet genetic need. And what I'm talking about are patients who have severely debilitating and often fatal genetic conditions, but no treatments. And the work that I've uh, been discussing for several years now with many of you um, is focused on the idea that oligonucleotide therapeutics can help, but uh, these often require mutation-specific action that poses challenges to the way that we go about doing our usual business. Um, for instance, uh, in some instances, uh, we can address large swaths of the population with oligonucleotide therapeutics for uh, the, the uh, uh, SMN2 mutation in patients with SMA, um, we can use phosphomorpholinos to skip exons, particular exons in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. We can even use uh, CRISPR editing with RNA guides for recurrent mutations in sickle cell disease. Uh, but each of these indications uh, are exceptions, not the rule. And most of the time, the mutations that we're actually encountering in patients are uh, very, very, they're usually rare. Um, and they're often even private. Uh, and they may be found in only a single individual. Uh, I think that this paper of ours from four years ago does uh, require uh, very little introduction. Uh, we were really fortunate to work with many folks um, uh, in the community to develop a just-in-time experimental oligonucleotide therapy for a young girl with Batten disease. Um, this experience, uh, this highly collaborative experience, um, allowed us to identify an unusual uh, mutation in a child named Mila Makovich who had CLN7 Batten disease. And her unusual mutation created a, a new splice mm -hmm. site in the middle of that gene that we managed to target with a splice switching oligonucleotide. And uh, the administration of an experimental drug based off of that therapeutic principle uh, showed uh, promising uh, clinical benefits to the patient in terms of patient reported outcomes and family reported outcomes, uh, uh, quality of life, as well as uh, objective clinical measures that we could capture in the neurology clinic uh, either by seizure diary collection or by uh, uh, video EEG recordings over her three years of treatment. Um, and we've been really fortunate to see um, this uh, first case spark uh, a, a really remarkable uh, set of efforts from many people in the field, um, an evolving ecosystem, uh, beginning with the regulators who have embraced this idea and have begun to uh, lay out guide rails but by which this type of work could continue to, to be conducted. That includes the FDA shown here in the top left, as well as uh, increasing engagement of regulators in, in internationally. Uh, that includes, of course, our own oligonucleotide therapeutic society, which was critical to the advancement of Nielsen in the first place. And then many other parties, including a nonprofit and academic, uh, the Enlorm Foundation, headed by Stan Crook and Frank Bennett, um, and many academic investigators, uh, our group, uh, UMass Medical, and John Watson, Bob Brown, Columbia uh, with uh, Neil Schneider, uh, and the Dutch Center for RNA Therapeutics. Many of these groups are now advancing really important efforts to uh, continue this type of work. Um, this, uh, to highlight the regulatory advances, the uh, uh, FDA um, had early discussions with us uh, to, uh, frame how individualized uh, oligonucleotide approaches could be advanced in a safe and responsible manner. 
And that led to the release of guidances that are now two years old for individualized medicine that I refer you to in case you haven't seen them. So um, these uh, guidances are available on FDA public web facing websites, as well as uh, the, uh, on the resource page of the N of One Collaborative, which I'll mention at the end. And uh, again, continuing this theme that uh, European and other international agencies are leaning into this with real uh, seriousness, um, the 1M1M coalition in Europe um, has uh, led uh, engagement with the European medical agencies, and uh, there is there are preparations underway for uh, this type of regulatory approach becoming available in Europe. Um, and uh, I am hopeful that that may also uh, be true in Australia and Asia uh, and other jurisdictions too. Um, I'll have a slide here on the NM1 Collaborative that I'll uh, actually skip over for now and mention at the end. So um, I'm going to highlight a couple of cases that have uh, come forth in this individualized oligonucleotide space since the original Mielsen effort. I will briefly discuss uh, cases that uh, uh, we've brought to clinic and re in review form. Some of these are cases that we've uh, discussed publicly in the past. And I, I will also discuss a, a few cases that, um, have, that we've worked on um, that are either in progress uh, or um, were started, but then uh, did not go to completion. And the point of providing these snapshots is to give you sort of a, a realistic survey for the types of efforts that go on and where they can succeed and where sometimes they stall and sometimes where they, uh, they may even fail. Um, I have uh, spoken publicly about this effort, which is now three years old to, for um, ataxia telangiectasia, a, uh, beginning with a young newborn um, who was born in California um, and was flagged for having an abnormal newborn screen. Um, her initial flag raised a concern for severe combined immunodeficiency. Um, and led to a diagnosis of a condition called ataxia telangiectasia, a severe and progressive cerebellar neurodegenerative condition. Uh, infants with this condition are uh, wheelchair requiring by the time they're 10 years of age. Um, and it's unfortunately typically fatal by young adulthood. Um, and uh, really by their teenage years, they've lost many uh, neurologic faculties. Their ability to communicate is severely impaired from their inability to uh, control their voice, their ability to read is impaired by their inability to coordinate eye movements. Um, in addition to not being able to walk or, or swallow, uh, there are uh, these are very serious neurologic complications of this very serious condition. Um, and this infant um, was diagnosed with ataxia telangiectasia. She had two mutations in the ATN kinase, uh, which is a critical mediator of the cellular DNA damage response. Um, and is the uh, gene which is uh, mutated in the recessive, um, uh, this is, that, that is mutated in, in um, uh, both copies of this gene are mutated um, in this condition. And uh, we have been running a trial now for the last three years because one of her ATM mutations created a new splice site that allowed us to develop a splice switching ASO for her, uh, which was developed by uh, a group shown here, uh, led by Jin Cook Kim. Uh, Claudia de Guzmao, uh, with uh, valuable senior advice from Tom Crawford, an expert in AAT, uh, Basil Darris, uh, in movement disorders and neurologist uh, at Boston Children's, and Chuck Berdy, my uh, our anesthesia and, uh, and neurobiology collaborator at Boston Children's. And this trial uh, initiated at age two for this patient um, has been ongoing for three years with the drug appearing to be well tolerated. Um, all, and with promising signs of efficacy in terms of the fact that our patient appears to be uh, less severely affected than most typical children at her current age six. Um, and we are looking forward uh, to um, trying to get further certainty as to efficacy um, in this, for this particular drug, for this particular condition, um, by expanding our trial to additional cases. Um, in this case, this was not a, an N of one, uh, but uh, there is a second child with ataxia telangiectasia due to this mutation that we identified about a year and a half ago. Um, and this child who was in Europe at the time, uh, we managed to arrange for her to initiate experimental treatment in Boston. Um, and that experimental treatment is now continuing under uh, the guidance of Mathis Synopsic and Rebecca Schul, our collaborators at the University of Tumingen. 
and represents what we think is the first European case under their jurisdiction uh, of uh, an individualized uh, experimental ASO treatment. In addition, um, highlighting this is not even N of two, but there are additional children, five so far identified in Turkey, uh, that we've been working with uh, both foundations in Turkey as well as uh, pediatric neurologists like uh, Banu Enlar, who is chair of Hacettepe University Pediatric Neurology. And uh, we have the opportunity and we are working to, uh, to um, expand this trial to these additional children. So um, this uh, is, was the second case to follow our, um, uh, our Mielsen first case. Um, I'll also share with you a, a, a third case that we've advanced uh, forward under uh, with uh, initiated at Boston Children's and in collaboration with uh, the University of Colorado Children's Hospital, as well as Enlorm. Uh, this is a patient with FLVCR1 associated blindness um, who presented uh, at, in infancy uh, with insensitivity to pain. She was having recurrent self-inflicted injuries uh, just uh, injuring her fingers and her and her and her toes, um, and we're getting having them get infected, and she didn't really seem to recognize uh, that uh, she was hurting herself. Um, simultaneously, she was also experiencing over the years progressive uh, loss of night vision, and then progressive tunnel vision, a restriction of her visual fields, um, and. Ophthalmologic examination um, revealed the worrisome, worrisome finding that she had retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, her genetic workup in the light of these clinical findings uh, suggested a diagnosis of something called PCARP, uh, posterior column ataxia with retinitis pigmentosa. Um, this condition diagnosed by Austin Larson and Emily McCourt, her geneticist and ophthalmologist at the University of Colorado, causes degeneration of the sensory neurons of the central nervous system, in particular dorsal root ganglion cells. And that accounts for a sensory neuropathy that was causing her insensitivity to pain. Um, it also causes progressive blindness. Um, and uh, this uh, by uh, inducing degeneration of retinal neurons. Um, and this is a, a gene which is of unclear biochemical function. It's uh, until recently. It was implicated both in mitochondrial function and heme transport, uh, but there's new data suggesting that this is a choline transporter that is involved in maintaining the bioenergetics of these critically sensitive DRGs and retinal neurons. Um, as an ultra rare condition with just a few dozen patients uh, identified with this mutation, which was first uh, discovered by Deborah Chiabrando at the University of Turin, um, there are no treatments or investigational or otherwise for this condition. But uh, we had been following this patient for several years because Austin had um, recognized that she had uh, an unusual mutation, uh, a mutation that was originally missed on clinical sequencing, uh, but then via whole genome sequencing uh, ordered by Austin and analyzed in collaboration with our laboratory, with Bo Zhao in my laboratory. We found that uh, whole genome, via whole genome sequencing that she had an intronic um, retroelement insertion, um, a mobile DNA element, a pseudo a pseudogene uh, that was deep in the intron eight of the ethylvcr one gene. This was a pseudogene insertion that uh, created a new splice site in between exons eight and nine, um, and uh, led to form incorporation of this pseudo exon that led to an early uh, nonsense mutation, uh, truncating the gene after the eighth exon and resulting in loss of function. Um, thankfully, uh, Bo Zhao in the lab was able to demonstrate uh, first uh, the existence of the pseudoexon, uh, the, the existence of this insertion, uh, the creation of the pseudoexon and the misplicing event, um, and then the rescue of that uh, with a uh, splice blocking ASO customized to the patient's mutation. And uh, this uh, initial uh, insight uh, led to us having discussions with the family, um, coordinated by uh, Emily, our, her uh, ophthalmologist, um, to discuss this, the potential cl clinical risks and benefits of the proposed intervention. Um, in this case, this was uh, maybe a more nuanced clinical discussion than, uh, than, than most. Um, this is not a fatal disorder, but it is seriously debilitating. 
Um, she has a severe sensory neuropathy that um, also causes uh, joint position sense uh, impairment and uh, could lead to incoordination in, in ataxia. And she really relies on her vision to navigate the world, um, both from a visual standpoint and also just from a mechanical standpoint. Um, and considering that uh, the sensory neuropathy was sadly probably irreversible, um, but her vision loss was progressive and impairing or threatening her remaining quality of life, um, we considered whether intravitreal ASO dosing may be appropriate here. And having discussed this with, uh, at length with her family, with her neurologist, her geneticist, and her ophthalmologist, um, as well as colleagues at Finlorm, uh, Frank Bennett and Scott Henry in particular at the outset, um, we elected to uh, offer this experimental intervention as a consideration and filed a, uh, an IND with the FDA Division of Ophthalmology uh, in April of this year. Um, this uh, proposed intervention was based off of the idea that intravitreal dosing uh, could slow her vision loss. Um, and in early clinical trial experiences uh, led by groups like ProQR, uh, uh, the hazard seemed relatively manageable that, uh, that to some uh, possibility of inflammation, some possibility of, of cataract formation uh, were uh, known hazards from those clinical experiences. But uh, both the family with uh, her clinical team's uh, counseling felt that these were manageable. Uh, for instance, cataracts uh, are uh, a unwanted complication, but one for which a surgical intervention is sufficient usually to uh, handle that. Um, and we could use other measures such as treating one eye initially to mitigate or stage the risk to demonstrate safety in one eye uh, before moving on to dosing both eyes. So uh, this is a program that uh, we were really, um, uh, we're excited uh, to uh, and hopeful uh, may launch soon uh, with permission from the FDA and, uh, and uh, permissive uh, manufacturing and safety studies uh, having been completed. Um, to give a flavor for uh, other ongoing projects, uh, the, the types of projects that uh, these types of efforts are, are being advanced for. Uh, and Lauren has described uh, having uh, accepted, uh, I think, 100 cases so far. There's a, a, a huge number of cases uh, for which this approach may be appropriate um, and is being tried. Um, in our group, um, some of the genes that we're working on include ABCA4, a cause of another inherited retinopathy. Uh, for which uh, multiple uh, deep intronic splicing mutations have been identified. Uh, we've also identified additional ATM cases um, and uh, other opportunities targeting some of the other genes shown here. I'll mention that some of these include uh, several other patients with uh, mild forms of CLN7 Batten disease, like our original Nielsen patient, um, that uh, might allow us to group experiences, if we're successful, um, in advancing this to clinical trial so that we can get some group efficacy signal as well as safety signal from uh, multiple individuals. Now, um, I'd like to uh, pivot to the, the, the next section of my talk, which is to highlight, though, uh, something that doesn't often get attention in talks like this. Uh, we usually tend to present success stories, uh, but I'd like to highlight some cases that we've taken on that have not proven successful for one reason or another. Um, and this to give a, a complete, a completer, a more complete picture of, of uh, what this type of work is like. And I think this is important in terms of setting expectations and discussions with families, um, because these are uh, such a high valence types of uh, experimental projects. Um, some time ago, uh, we began uh, working actually maybe only about a year or so after Mielsen on Neiman Pick disease. And in particular, we were inspired to work uh, on Neiman Pick because of uh, our meeting a really uh, remarkable uh, pair of twins, uh, 14 years old at the time, who had Neiman Pick type C. Uh, for those of you who know uh, or are unfamiliar, um, Neiman Pick type C is a lysosomal storage disorder. Um, it's uh, fundamentally a, a defect in a cholesterol transporter, which is localized at the lysosomal and endosomal membrane encoded by the NPC1 gene. And, and when this uh, gene is malfunctioning, uh, it leads to cholesterol accumulation and progressive neurodegeneration 
in, uh, in uh, especially in the cerebellum, but it really affecting all parts of the brain too. And this uh, leads to uh, very severely debilitating symptoms um, and ultimately death. Um, a typical course uh, may include uh, difficulty walking, uh, language and hearing impairment beginning in young childhood, and then death by young adulthood. And uh, it's a condition for which, uh, despite uh, multiple efforts, uh, including uh, a really heroic effort uh, led, to, uh, led by a family to develop cyclodextrin as a potential treatment, uh, there have been no truly clinically transformative treatments uh, for this condition that really changed the course of the disease. Now, these twins had uh, a interesting recurrent mutation that is sometimes seen in NPC1. Um, this is a depetronic mutation, 1,009 nucleotides uh, in between exons 9 and 10. It's upstream of exon 10 by 1,009 nucleotides. It's a point mutation, but um, it creates a novel splice site that activates the formation of a disrupting pseudoaxon. Um, this disrupting pseudoaxon uh, leads to a frame shift um, after exon 9 and uh, early truncation of the NPC1 gene. And uh, Jinka Kim and Yuhan Huang in my lab many years ago actually began a, a series of testing a series of ASO designs to try and inhibit the use of the pseudoaxon uh, in this context of this mutation, designing um, a series of uh, splice blocking ASOs targeting the splice acceptor site, the splice uh, donor site, as well as exonic splice enhancers uh, in the region. And uh, this work started by Jim Cook and then uh, continued and picked up uh, by Yuhan um, showed that several of these leads were really quite biochemically successful rather quickly. Using patient fibroblasts uh, at increasing doses, uh, NP004 is a, is a uh, two prime MOE phosphorothiolate backbone uh, ASO shown here, uh, showed uh, an ability to elicit dose dependent um, block of the mutated pseudoaxon including, including form. Uh, very strong initial progress or an initial hit that suggested that this should be amenable. Um, as a further proof of concept, um, we also did the same thing with a slightly different chemistry that uh, collaborator Mark or others um, provided to us uh, thiomorpholino chemistry shown on the right half of this gel. Um, I, I won't have time to say much more about the TMO chemistry. Um, but uh, I will go on to point out that Yuhan then uh, went on to show that uh, these uh, initial leads showing rescue of RNA splicing patterns also increased uh, NPC1 protein expression in patient cells um, and uh, giving us uh, uh, increases of up to twofold in the baseline uh, levels. But um, unfortunately, this project, um, which had proceeded very quickly, um, had uh, to be terminated uh, because the, uh, our patients in question, uh, unfortunately, passed away uh, right around this time point when we were looking at these last gels that uh, I was showing you. Um, they uh, sadly passed away from complications of their condition, um, uh, an infection on top of, the, on top of their existing neurologic uh, weakened state um, led to them both passing um, right the week that we actually were uh, beginning to discuss these IND launching IND enabling safety studies. And uh, I think that that points out that the time sensitivity for trying to embark on these efforts is really critical, that there's a, a very small window for therapeutic opportunity here and um, trying to balance speed as well as urgency and urgency uh, with, uh, with also scientific care um, and uh, is one of the ongoing challenges for each of these cases. Now, this story is, uh, I pitched it as a case that, that has been quote unquote unsuccessful. And I will say that there is a silver lining here, which is that the uh, work that's been done to develop a, a tool compound for this uh, treatment um, is, has been put to further good use. It turns out that some few years ago, uh, the, a group in Barcelona had invested in making a mouse model of this particular NPC1 mutation, which is actually recurrent in the European population. Uh, there have been more than one patient uh, reported with this particular uh, 
uh, variant as a cause of their anemophic disease. And so as a result of that, having a mouse model, we've put our ASOs to good use to uh, further generate evidence that could be supportive of an, an intervention, a clinical intervention with this ASO in the future. Uh, this is an ASO which is effectively warehoused and ready to go. Um, if we can uh, support uh, our initial patient fibroblast data with in vivo data, then that it buttresses the idea that this um, is a worthy uh, candidate for intervention should future patients arise. And uh, without, while well, I don't have time to go into the data, this uh, really uh, wonderful collaboration with uh, Daniel Raul Grinberg, uh, Mara Dearson, and Maria Martinez uh, de Laguna Cabredo, uh, our collaborators in, in Barcelona, um, as well as Paul Gisson and Haiyan Yu at the University of College London, are showing really promising results that we are um, seeing uh, signs of in vivo efficacy. And I will further um, go on to share that uh, Paul and Haiyan have even identified an additional potential clinical patient uh, with this mutation. Um, and there may be prospects for additional patients uh, beyond the one that they've identified right now. So um, this uh, work uh, started again in our lab and extended through collaboration and uh, has now also added Enlorem as a collabor collaborator uh, to see if um, this mutational target, which we've de-risked somewhat, uh, may be appropriate for clinical inter intervention in Paul's patient. I'll go through um, uh, another uh, example of uh, a case uh, that didn't have the outcome that we wanted. Um, this is work that we've been uh, that we started um, some uh, three years ago uh, to uh, work on casein Q2 epileptic encephalopathy. Um, what is casein Q2 epileptic encephalopathy? Well, these are this is a severe childhood condition associated with mutations in a brain expressed voltage gated potassium channel, and uh, this uh, gene, when mutated, um, impairs. Uh, well, it results in uh, neuronal hyperexcitability and seizures, as well as severe neurodevelopmental delays. Uh, in fact, there are two clinical presentations, though, that are worth highlighting that arise from mutations in this gene. Uh, one is more severe than the other. The first is uh, benign familial neonatal seizures, and the second is uh, neonatal epileptic encephalopathy. Uh, as the name suggests, the benign form is actually relatively mild. Uh, this is a, a disease described in 1964, um, and it was um, characterized in large pedigrees where multiple uh, individuals from the same family and multiple generations exhibited the following presentation. They would at birth exhibit uh, the onset of spontaneous seizures in the very first few days of, of life. Um, luckily, these would then remit and go away at a few months of age. And thankfully, neuropsychological development for those individuals uh, ultimately proved to be normal. Uh, thus, of course, allowing it to pass along through generations in these pedigrees as shown on the right. And it turns out that this mild phenotype um, is caused by mutations in KCNQ2. It's caused by a specific type of mutation in KCNQ2. These are heterozygous mutations that uh, completely disable one of two KCNQ2 copies. These are frame shifts or nonsense mutations. Um, and they don't impact the remaining copy of casein Q2. And so this uh, uh, type of mutation causes haploinsufficiency, effectively a 50% reduction in effective gene dosage, um, and is actually a relatively happy outcome of mutation in this particular gene that uh, allows the, these types of mutations to be inherited um, in uh, human families. Now there's a severe form of this condition as well. Uh, and the severe phenotype associated with mutations in casein Q2 is shown on this slide here. Um, these children exhibit daily seizures also beginning the first week of life. And unlike in the previous slide, these seizures um, um, have severe uh, neuro neurologic consequences. Um, these uh, children exhibit, in addition to those early seizures, uh, low muscle tone, um, and quadriplegia and global developmental delay with typically moderate to severe intellectual disability. And the important molecular distinction between this severe presentation and the previous is that KCNQ2 um, NEE mutations are typically not inherited, 
because the condition is severe, but they are de novo. They arise spontaneously in the transmission of genetic material from parents to child. And these are de novo mutations. They're not null mutations, but they're point mutations. And there are special types of point mutations that appear to alter one copy of the casein Q2 gene. They do render it non-functional, but in addition to rendering it non-functional like the null mutations, they also allow that copy to be expressed and they interfere with the remaining good copy of casein Q2. The result of this is that the effective gene dosage in these individuals is much less than 50%. It has a dominant negative activity that, that both uh, blocks that copy from working and blocks the other copy from working. And this is the mechanistic model for why these children do so much more poorly. Um, there are no effective treatments for this severe form. Um, there was a clinical trial of a small molecule, casein Q2 channel opener done in 2005 that unfortunately showed really limited uh, efficacy, certainly not uh, of, of uh, transformative benefit. To drive this point home, um, these uh, plots on the left and the right show a schematic of the KCNQ2 gene um, with in yellow mutations uh, on the left uh, are mutations that are associated with the benign form of, of this condition. And what you see are lots of yellow and orange dots corresponding to loss of function mutations, or some missense mutations that are presumably uh, causing uh, equivalent loss of function impacts. In contrast, on the right half of, of the slide are mutations that have been reported in the severe form of this condition, neonatal epileptic encephalopathy. And again, you see lots of red dots here, but the point is you see uh, all red dots, that these are mis all missense mutations. You do not see loss of function mutations um, in the severe form. Um, and these are the, the missense mutations that are uh, presumed to act via this dominant negative effect. So um, our work on this case um, was um, really uh, sort of inspired or stimulated by um, uh, meeting an index uh, patient who then introduced us to this community. Um, and for uh, to provide that real world clinical example, uh, our index case was a 23 month old girl with a severe form of casein Q2. Um, and she had uh, genetic testing showing she had a de novo uh, missense mutation, H228R, that had been previously reported in, to be in that category of mutations on the right, uh, in that category of mutations that cause um, dominant negative impact in the severe clinical outcome. And uh, with uh, the two other patients uh, who had been identified with this particular recurrent mutation in the past, um, they suffered, unfortunately, from global developmental delay and they were unable to, uh, for instance, they were unable to support their head um, or sit or stand or crawl or walk uh, or speak at age two and a half and six years, respectively. Um, we did work uh, in collaboration with uh, Jeff Abbott's lab, an electrophysiologist at the University of uh, California, Irvine uh, and chair of pharmacology um, to demonstrate using um, a heterologous Xenopus expression system uh, that this H228R uh, mutation is in fact a dominant negative allele. Uh, this is a complicated slide. I think I'll just hit the high points, which what we're doing here, the experiment is to take Xenopus frog eggs and to inject them with the casein Q2 channel, either 100% wild type casein Q2 channel or a 50 50 uh, wild type and H228R mutant channel or various other iterations on that theme. And the point is that in the black uh, plot, you see the effects of, uh, you see um, channel recordings current uh, recorded from uh, the completely wild type uh, frog injections. In uh, the uh, green, you see the expression that you get uh, when you co-inject normal casein Q2 with the mutant H228R uh, allele. And you see a sharp, severe diminishment of channel function. Um, Contrast that with um, injecting normal casein Q2 with a benign mutation, a, a mutation that causes the benign form of this condition, which leads to essentially uh, a haploinsufficiency, that gives you the trace in red. Finally, in blue, uh, what you see is that if you can knock down half of the mutant, 
um, then you ought to improve currents back towards the benign form. And that's the basis for the therapeutic hypothesis. So the therapeutic strategy then um, for this case was to uh, try to elicit allele-specific knockdown of the mutant copy of casein Q2. And our goal here is really simple. On the left-hand side, we have neonatal epileptic encephalopathy. On the left is that poison missense mutation that is not working. It's also inhibiting the remaining good copy, hence the frowny face on the right. Um, and if we can elicit allele-specific knockdown of that bad copy, we're hoping to convert it to the benign familial form. Um, this is work that we did over, painstaking work that we did over three years to try to elicit allele-specific knockdown using an antisense oligonucleotide strategy. Um, uh, Tojo Nakayama in my group uh, with, uh, 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 led this project and um, we identified 44 hetero heterozygous linked casein Q2 polymorphisms using both short and long read sequencing at the site. Um, we did this so that we could not only target the H228R mutation, but, but also we could target um, uh, linked common SNPs that were on the same haplotype. That would give us more molecular targets. Um, he designed six or more ASOs for each of these uh, 44 sites, found that uh, a little less than half of them supported some knockdown, 50% or more knockdown, prompting additional ASO interrogation and design. And at the end of the day, there were three sites that appeared to support good potency and allele selectivity. Um, this was a very large screen of over a thousand ASOs over time. Um, and shown here is a summary of the results where uh, the amount of um, wild type expression is shown on, on the x-axis. The amount of mutant expression is shown on the y-axis. And uh, the point is that we're looking for things that don't knock down the wild type very much, but uh, do suppress the mutant expression. And we found a number of leads uh, highlighted in uh, red there. Um, there are a total of seven listed on this slide um, that were in that bottom right quadrant where they didn't seem to affect wild type expression very much, uh, but uh, did uh, reduce levels of mutant uh, to anywhere between 30 and 40% of, of normal. We did uh, dose response curves to look at these top allele selective leads and were able to, to demonstrate reasonable selectivity uh, between uh, mutant and wild type copies. The uh, amount of expression is shown for wild type in blue and mutant in red. And the difference between the two um, shows you the discrimination index of these ASO leads. Uh, but unfortunately, um, we got to the point of doing this very large screen and getting to the point of having these reasonably selective um, reagents, uh, but then found that um, all of these top leads failed to pass tolerability testing in in vivo mouse experiments. And um, that, unfortunately, is where the project sits. Um, it, I think points out that these um, uh, that you need multiple uh, factors to go right. You need to demonstrate potency. You need to demonstrate uh, allele selectivity, and then obviously you need tolerability. And that this uh, combination of you know Goldilocks parameters for all three of these um, is often difficult to achieve. Now, having said that, there have been great successes uh, or promising uh, successes for allele selective ASO designs. Um, in the, for instance, the Huntington's field, um, or um, I, I'm very enthusiastic about uh, uh, promising early results of an allele selective ASO uh, that uh, Wendy Chung, and, and uh, in working in collaboration with Enlorem, is administering for a patient with a severe KIF1A mutation. Um, but uh, I just illustrate this project to, to, as an example that uh, it may not always go the way that one hopes. Um, finally, um, I would uh, like to take this forum to uh, talk about a case that uh, I uh, have spoken publicly about as well, but maybe not explicitly to this audience. Um, another case uh, where uh, an ASO and a design project did not go the way that uh, we ultimately would have liked. Um, this was a project for KCNT1 epilepsy, which is, uh, like the previous KCNQ2, a very severe neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, this is uh, a condition which is, um, uh, can cause a syndrome that's called epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures. 
Um, in these instances, uh, children in the first few days of life have the onset of dozens of seizures per day that are unresponsive to anti-epileptic anti medication. And um, unlike this somewhat more complicated case in Q2 story where there's a dominant negative mode of action, um, Mutations in the KCNT1 channel that cause this condition have a toxic gain of function mechanism. This particular um, index case, uh, there was a de novo mutation in R474H, a recurrent bad actor in this uh, field um, that uh, results in uh, changes to the uh, sodium gated potassium channel that's encoded by KCNT1, also known as SLAC. Um, and the effect of this mutation is to create a leaky channel that uh, allows excess current to flow and drives neurons to fire uh, repeatedly. And the very severe consequence of this condition is um, intractable epilepsy, neurodevelopmental stagnation, and early death. Of a series of 17 patients with KCNT1 mutations and this epilepsy of infancy phenotype, um, 17 out of 17 had uh, very uh, profound neurologic impairment, and uh, half of them died young. Uh, those who died young uh, died at a median age of just three years, uh, often from sudden unexpected death of epilepsy associated with the severe seizures. Uh, we embarked on a case and T1 knockdown strategy um, to uh, try to uh, develop uh, a therapeutic approach for this condition. Um, and uh, this work done in collaboration with, uh, uh, with uh, Steve Petru's lab uh, and Len Kesmark and Imran Karashi at Yale, as well as uh, conversations uh, with Praxis, which had a parallel program of their own uh, targeting KCNT1 at the same time, um, involved uh, the screening of uh, KCNT1 knockdown ASOs to reduce the levels of this toxic mutated uh, channel. Um, and in silico and in vitro um, design and screening involving thousands of designs, hundreds of sequences, and, uh, and uh, many leads tested in rodent models, eventually uh, leading us to a single investigational clinical candidate that was able to elicit uh, more than 50% knockdown of the KCMT1 gene target in cell lines and patient neurons. These were uh, neuroblastoma cells on the left, patient IPS derived neurons in the middle and dose response curves on the right, showing good potency with an IC50 in the one nanomolar range. And we were also able to demonstrate electrophysiologic rescue uh, with uh, restoration of more normal electrophysiologic current patterns. In black are the normal currents transduced by this channel, normal potassium currents transduced uh, in cells expressing this channel. In red are the exaggerated total currents seen in patients with this mutation. Um, and then in purple are the effects of administration of an ASO knocking down KCNT1, uh, showing restoration back towards the normal electrophysiologic traces. Uh, this uh, project was uh, given the green light from the FDA uh, in September 2020 uh, to uh, uh, start a very small scale, given the seriousness of this condition. Um, in uh, just two patients. Uh, it was supported by uh, in vivo uh, proof of concept studies and a mouse KCNT1 epilepsy model uh, with uh, work done in collaboration with C. Petru, as well as animal safety studies in intrathecal rats. And uh, as I have mentioned um, and has got some public attention, um, we saw a series of adverts events in both individuals um, in addition to signs of efficacy. Um, and I think that this is an important case to highlight and again, bring to the community uh, for discussion. Uh, seizures in case number one did show significant reductions in seizure count and severity over time. This is a graph of patient reported seizures uh, from time zero uh, through up, uh, up to uh, 350 days after the first dose. And the individual ASO doses showing, shown at escalating levels are shown in the red stars. Um, it's a bit of a messy graph because uh, we had to change the recording uh, scheme right around date 230 because of a change in the quality of the seizures. Um, but I will just have to ask you to uh, perhaps um, trust but verify that uh, there were reductions in seizure count and severity um, that were seen over this course. The um, 
trial, though, was complicated by a very serious adverse event that was recognized at th day 350, where uh, we noted that there was hydrocephalus that had developed in the first patient sometime over the course of the preceding months, um, and that led to trial withdrawal. Uh, patient number two also had a serious adverse event, but also had a, a, perhaps a clearer seizure response. And so to give equal weight to both of those, um, at beginning at day zero, um, our patient was having between five and 15 seizures per day. After the first, second, and third doses, and then the fourth dose, uh, we saw that those seizure frequencies plummet down to almost zero, between zero and three. Uh, and that uh, remarkable effect lasted for uh, about 50 days. Uh, but we also detected signs of early ventricular enlargement. We picked it up earlier in the second case. Um, and this patient uh, there uh, in recognition, uh, after recognizing this, got a, a ventricular peritoneal shunt, which effectively dealt with the ventricular enlargement and clinically stabilized her, uh, but led us to pause this program um, uh, for uh, until we could let things cool off and try to understand what had happened. Um, I think uh, I, we've discussed in, uh, in public fora that uh, ventricular enlargement has also been seen in highest dose groups of a Huntington's disease ASO trial. Um, and I'd say that uh, much work remains to be done to see if this uh, is really the same mechanism of action or something different. Um, I, I do, I'm personally of the opinion that uh, the, the dose dependent effects seen in that, the highest dose groups in that trial um, had significant similarities to uh, what we observed in this trial. And I think it certainly put out there the idea that this may be a new and important potential toxicity of high dose ASOs. Certainly some sequences are, are more uh, are likely more prone to this than others because there have been many very, very safely tolerated doses uh, given of Spinraza and uh, other, other investigational ASOs in addition to that. Um, but I think getting to the root of this is gonna be critically important. One idea that's been put out there is that perhaps this, is, uh, this type of effect is uh, due to activation of the innate immune system and cytokine release and a pro-inflammatory response. And while I think that is possible, uh, and there are some clinical signs such as a slightly marginally elevated protein count in some of these, um, in, in this trial, in these two patients and, and in others that we've seen, um, I'm not sure that it's gonna be particularly uh, simple to work out. Uh, for instance, um, in uh, cytokine release testing of the RKCNT1 ASO, we saw no effect of this drug um, on cytokine release um, and, uh, or complement in inactivation, but complement activation or other hematologic parameters. So um, I think that this is something that I know many folks are working on and uh, we hope to have more to say about this uh, in the not too distant future. Um, our KCNT1 program um, was paused as a result of this, um, but uh, we have been given permission to uh, do a restart of this trial with appropriately reduced doses and increasing our uh, monitoring plan. Um, Ron and uh, team, um, I want to be respectful. I started late because of my mistake on scheduling, and I'm deeply apologetic for that. Um, at this point, I'd be happy to stop given that it's already 12.03, or I could continue under, under the, the guise that this is recorded, and uh, it's up to you. I, I'm happy to, to, to take your lead on uh, where we ought to go. Uh, yeah, so so first of all, I apologize for uh, for the misunderstanding in the, the starting time of the, of the webinar, uh, but Thanks a lot for uh, being so fast and uh, uh, being present uh, so uh, so quickly online. So I think it might be nice to have time for a few questions. Uh, to have like a, I'm not sure it, it's okay to have like a five to ten minutes Q and A uh, session for now. Let's do that. Let's do that, and I will just then rapidly advance quickly to the acknowledgement so that we can put that up while yeah. the questions are rolling in. I think it's uh, very appropriate. And I, I, I really um, like it uh, to not only cover the successful stories that uh, are up in the media and that uh, are real um, uh, scientific highlights, but it's also nice to show the less successful uh, stories because I think also we can 
learn a lot from these uh, less successful uh, stories as well. Um, so if you have questions for Tim, uh, please use the Q&A function. Uh, and then maybe I would like to start actually with the, with that particular point. So I think you showed some successful stories, you showed some unsuccessful stories. Um, so, uh, and unsuccessful stories have all the different kind of aspects. And I think also one part that you mentioned is the um, uh, warehousing these oligos. Um, so uh, what I always think is super important, especially in an uh, open scientific community is uh, data sharing. Um, so, and not only sharing uh, successful com uh, compounds, but also sharing unsuccessful com uh, compounds. So uh, that can just fail based on uh, whatever mode of action. So do you have, have any ideas how to build a, uh, a database or a network or whatever uh, to, to share these kind of things? Thank you, Ron. That, that's a really important point that you've raised. And um, I, I do think that these, uh, these interventions and these types of efforts uh, are in many ways maybe a very different beast than the standard drug development programs that, uh, that we typically advance. And, and we, in our particular case, you know, our particular group has focused on the most severe conditions uh, for which um, the risks of these types of interventions um, are weighed very heavily against very, very severe clinical risks. And I think that, and the reason I'm going back to that comment is that it, it does set us up in a situation uh, where we may encounter uh, these types of events um, and it may be appropriate to encounter them, but the important the important thing is to learn from each one and to to try to avoid them in the future. Um, I think that uh, there are um, for very small populations, um, one of the benefits of working with ASO drugs that may target very small populations is that there may be less overhead in terms of the types of restrictions on sharing for those types of uh, compounds. Um, certainly mutation specific ASOs currently are not seen as commercializable in any way. And we all know that when something is potentially is either commercializable or could be seen as potentially in the future commercializable, there are extra strings attached to, to sharing in those instances uh, for understandable reasons. Um, the Valerian sequence uh, we've uh, openly shared with uh, many individuals, anyone who's asked for it, uh, we've been able to share it uh, because of this reason. Um, and then it, hopefully we ex hope that it'll be uh, the first in a series of reference compounds that could be used for uh, the field to work through uh, assays that could be developed uh, in vitro or in vivo uh, to understand exactly the mechanism of some of these adverse events. Um, and what I imagine is that uh, that uh, there's, a, a, well, what it, I shouldn't say I imagine. Um, in the N of One Collaborative, uh, there have been many parties now who have stood up and said that we're willing to, to share uh, data, preclinical data from these uh, N of One efforts uh, freely in this manner to create this reference library, uh, whereby uh, sequences that are not tolerated at various stages can then be compared for um, a group inspection to understand uh, what the predictors of that should be. Yeah, I, I think this is super important uh, to share uh, share data, and not only the positive ones, but also the one that uh, do not have an effect or even do have a a toxic effect. So, and and uh, because I think um, your group, I think the Enlorum uh, initiative, uh, you have also in Europe, you have different initiatives uh, working on uh, personalized uh, ASO therapies. So uh, there are potentially there are many many patients out there. Uh, and if I look just at the, uh, you know, uh, here in Leiden, we are doing like a, a super small clinical trial with only two patients. Uh, one of our uh, neighboring hospitals also does a clinical trial with only two patients. And uh, if I uh, listen carefully to the neurologist, they say, okay, those two patients are all we can do. It's super intensive to uh, um, um, to follow up these patients uh, to have like uh, uh, so. How would you envision like the, the infrastructure? Are there uh, steps needed to change infrastructure or how, how should you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I think um, 
this is a really important topic. And, and uh, one of the things that you've highlighted, and maybe I think my talk also highlights is that these are very resource intensive interventions. Um, and the amount of expertise that goes into trying to advance this at every single level, even from patient selection at the very, very beginning, understanding the genetics, understanding the clinical syndrome enough to say this is a worthy case, I shouldn't use that word, that word worthy, that this is an appropriate case. Um, and all of the expertise required to develop and design and test the drug um, and then to administer it. Um, they're incredibly resource inten intensive efforts. And there's no doubt that the existing infrastructure really was not meant for this. Um, I think that one, the infrastructure has got to change and everyone I think recognizes that our ability to test drugs for rare disease um, is rapidly uh, uh, becoming a rate limiting step in, uh, in um, the design of therapeutics. Um, even at places like Boston Children's Hospital, we're trying to play catch up uh, to uh, have sufficient clinical trials uh, team members to run even traditional trials, not to mention a proliferation of small scale trials. Um, I do think that um, one of the uh, other pieces of, of infrastructure that um, would be uh, really important to, to bring to bear is to have, um, during this time when it is so resource intensive, we should, we need to pay very careful attention to which case, the, to make sure that the cases that we do push forward are maximally informative to the field. I would like to think that our KCNT1 experience um, has in addition to highlighting uh, some of the potential adverse events that could come from, uh, from an ASO such as ours, uh, that it also has provided some important clinical lesson that, uh, and clinical optimism that uh, targeting a channelopathy, a toxic gain of function channelopathy may have the potential for remarkable clinical effects. I still, in addition to being sad about the impacts of these adverse events on our families, I still look at the seizure traces in patients one and two and see that as, uh, as reason to fortify our uh, other people's efforts, ours and other people's efforts to continue targeting uh, these uh, toxic channelopathies with uh, genetically targeted drugs. Um, I think that picking our cases to make sure that, that the resources we spend pay off in terms of uh, making it easier for other people to then proceed further with some preliminary evidence is really important. And so very careful case selection is, is one that I think I'm going to choose to highlight. Yeah, and so, so maybe to follow up on the case selections. So how do you select the cases that are, uh, I, can, I can imagine a lot of things that are important. So, so what would be your uh, uh, pipeline to, to, to choose these patients? And how long does it take you to select the uh, patients that are amenable for such a therapy? Because I can imagine that you get lots of cases daily or, or weekly. So uh, it, it can take up all your time, right? So how do you decide which cases to pursue and which one to uh, not? I think, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. And, and the way I'll choose to answer it is that, uh, that it's not me, <laughs> that, that it, it requires, I mean, we, we have, we try to be in, insanely thoughtful and, and to think through every dimension of a case before we decide to take it on. But I think it's also really important to have infrastructure and systems uh, to make sure that cases are reviewed from multiple different angles. Um, in our particular case, what I'm referring to is that we have, uh, I have the assistance of colleagues that are in our hospital um, that represent expertises from hematology, gene therapy, neurology, ethics, um, and community uh, members um, to really provide that lens of looking at a case and to say, well, from the perspectives of these multiple parties, what can we learn about the, the genetics of the condition, about the uh, mechanism of disease, about the therapeutic window, about the clinical outcome measures that you choose to use? Um, how do you consider equity um, in, in the selection of this case versus other potentially uh, appropriate cases to uh, I think that uh, having that type of system with multidisciplinary output that's not just focused on the science of that one case, but the impact on the greater field, that's been helpful to us. Uh, thanks. I fully agree on that. Um, just going to the Q&A. So if you have a question, you can still type in the Q&A. So we have a question from uh, Ludus. 
Uh, do you think the underlying mechanism, uh, RNAsH, knockdown or steric blocking uh, splice modulating oligo, might account for the differences in safety issues for the neurologic diseases? As Nussinersen has been successful, while the failures you mentioned are both on knockdown ASOs. Uh, Lourdes, that's a very uh, appropriate question given the selection of cases that I happen to choose. Um, I would say that I, um, I'm not sure that that's the case. Uh, I don't mean to, to throw knockdown ASOs under the bus uh, through my selection of examples. I, of course, in theory, uh, I think that RNAs H knockdown does have um, additional considerations beyond uh, uh, relatively simple spike, steric splice blocking sequences that that I do that do worry me at times uh, off target effects um, the fact that it's uh, that uh, very transient associations with it with uh, a, a, a partially misaligned target could lead to RNAs cleavage um, there are documented uh, off target effects that RNAs H knockdown ASOs can have uh, on especially on high abundance uh, transcripts but I will I just want to caution that even though perhaps I inadvertently chose cases to, to highlight that might look like that. I don't know that that's necessarily proven yet. Um, maybe another way of saying it is that I, um, I think that uh, we're looking carefully at both splice switching as well as RNA-H knockdown ASOs. Um, our, our guard is up uh, for both of them equally. Yeah, and then uh, a follow-up question. So I think this is nicely in line from, uh, from Mark. Uh, do you have yes. any clues uh, as to why the KCN you two oligos were poorly tolerated, would change in the chemistry or the dosing regime help at all? So it's kind of in a similar line as the previous question. Mark, really excellent question. And um, I think that uh, at one level, we're, we're, we're probably a victim of small numbers. It, it, it took uh, quite a, a large amount of screening to get to the point of uh, getting generating the candidates that we landed upon. And the candidates were concentrated on a relatively small number of targets, three targets. Um, what that meant is that these, these three targets, um, the, the seven sequences shared significant um, similarities in terms of base composition. Um, and there was a good amount of GC content uh, in these particular sequ target sequences. Um, I think that we were unlucky and that the target sequences that, that ended up working for us um, uh, were probably correlated with some features that, uh, uh, that uh, are uh, um, Correlated with, with, with features that, that that may be associated with the acute neurobehavioral toxicity that's been um, uh, that's been seen as one of the known modes of, of tolerability problems with ASOs. Yeah, uh, there, there may be more a practical question from my side. So, what are the appropriate uh, tox tests that you need to do uh, within the lab, and uh, is there any room for improvement of uh, these kind of assays? And and maybe to follow up a bit, uh, so uh, are these more stringent for larger cases? So if you do a, a study for a, a whole patient group rather than an individual uh, patient. Really, yeah, a, a very important practical question. And um, I'll offer my, uh, my personal perspective on this, which has been largely learned from interactions with the community and, and the literature, but there are many others who are very well equipped to, uh, to answer this uh, too. Um, but from our perspective, um, looking uh, for signs of acute neurotoxicity um, through uh, ICV injections or intrathecal injections and functional observation scores in rodents um, is one of the three criteria that, that I would consider. Um, uh, second is looking for chronic neurotoxicity uh, that might exhibit uh, not acutely, like not in the in the one to twenty four hour period, but over the the two to three month period, um, is also important because uh, there are, have been signs of delayed changes to uh, neuronal health, for instance, that, that have cropped up in in uh, several preclinical studies, uh, and then third, just looking at immunostimulatory properties. I think that these are three of the the most important uh, pieces that uh, are I think best practices in the field. Uh, is there room for improvement? Yes, huge room for improvement, uh, as we as we can tell. Um, and as far as you know, how do we think about the, when to use these, and what are the standards for large and small populations? And I think uh, 
it is absolutely appropriate to consider uh, that uh, if one is proposing to enroll and expose hundreds or thousands of patients to a particular investigational agent, then it is just simply logical that uh, that bears additional testing. Um, if it is uh, smaller numbers uh, and where um, you where those uh, cultures change is if it's a very small number of individuals, and then what do you do if it's a very small number of, ind of individuals who um, are at high likelihood of passing away in a short period of time? That's where some of these more uh, aggressive um, interventions might be considered appropriate, and that's where we have to tread very carefully. But that's what's underlying some of our thinking, for instance, in the KCNT1 case. Yeah, so, and uh, I think what I hear from, from your side is that, so for now, I think most tox tests uh, include animal studies. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you env envision a way where we use like more uh, human-based models? Or I think also what's quite often uh, a discussion is uh, you use a healthy mouse model or a healthy rat model. So should we use like uh, patient derived models or should we focus on uh, more on diseased animal models or are these things to take into consideration? Yeah, good point. It's, it's probably safest to say that at this point, uh, animal models are incredibly imperfect and the best that we've got. Um, and there's no question that uh, we need to have better predictors of these types of, uh, of potential toxicities. and. There's a real concern that the animal models may miss things. There's also arguably, you know, a similar important, similarly important concerns that animal models may cause you to um, uh, to rule out a compound that that actually would have been okay. Um, so th it's very clear that we need better improvements uh, to use more to to try to get human-based systems to the point where they could provide, you know, fill those gaps. Um, I don't know that we're there yet, but it doesn't mean that we're not super interested. I think that's really critically important for the field. Cool. Well, uh, Tim, uh, thanks a lot. Once again, I apologize for uh, for the miscommunication about the starting time of the of the webinar, but super happy that you, that you showed up uh, very <laughs> very quickly. So uh, and that we could have this uh, uh, very nice uh, overview of uh, of all the work that you performed in the last uh, uh, couple of years. Um, so to the audience, thank you for uh, staying a little bit later, and apologize for uh, letting you wait uh, the first fifteen minutes. Um, we will have the next webinar in two weeks and then we will have uh, Shalini Anderson. So uh, thank you very much for joining and see you in, in two weeks. Ron, thank you so much. It's an honor to participate. Yeah, thanks a lot.